This is the Horse Radio Network. Hey, you're listening to Adulting with Horses, the best place to be if you can't be at the barn. We are your co-hosts and equine authors, Heather Wallace and Natalie keller Reinert. As Crazy Horse Girls, we don't take ourselves too seriously in the saddle or out. We celebrate the things that make us different. Join us as we talk about horses and pop culture and get a little weird in a fun way. Thank you for being a little weird with us. Natalie, I missed you. I missed you. I haven't talked to you since like three days ago, four days ago. I know. It's been too long. (laughs) Feels like a lifetime. (laughs) I went on vacation and and I'm still like struggling to reenter humanity. What did you do? Can you can you share? Uh, I went to a two day music festival in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Okay, what's the average age at a music festival in Atlantic City? It's either 80 or 18. I can't decide which. Nope. There was a huge array of ages. And a lot of the bands that were playing were, um, for example, like the second day Blink-182 was a headliner. So there was plenty of people my age because we grew up (laughs) listening to that. Oof. Not me. No. Well, I grew up mocking that. I was not... I did not stay. Like, they played three songs, and they started talking about, like, they were being very misogynistic on stage, which I thought was mm, a little tone deaf. And after the third song, I was like, Jason, let's just go. Like, I'm done. Like, I don't want to hear it anymore. So I wasn't there for them anyway. <laughs> what were I they? got to see all my bands. <laughs> what were they saying that was misogynistic? Now I'm curious. Every time they opened Or they just, song, like, talking about how hot women are. Oh, no. No, no, no. Worse than that. It was like, hi, this song's about the clitoris. And then another one was like, this song is about when I went cooter hunting. Like, that's how they were introducing songs. It was nasty. Oh, my God. Yeah. And apparently, like, what never was like, my teenage daughter? Like, what the fuck? Yeah. They, even when they were, like, popular, which was a really long time ago, I would just like to remind them, uh, they they did something that I didn't like. And I was like, oh, I won't have anything to do with that band, even though I also did not like their music. But um, I don't remember what it was now. And I was like, you you can't support this band. And this was way before like had, people had more ethics. Yeah, <laughs> was this like, was no. the first time. So now that we've alienated all the Blink-182 yeah. fans in our audience. <laughs> well, I was there. It was. So I'm going to a music festival in September. Really? Which, what kind of music? Uh, the National their music festival so like um uh the walkman one of my absolute favorite bands is going to be there and patty smith is going to be there oh cool and this dude called barty strange that i'm really into <laughs> and uh pavement did i say pavement is going to be there so like a bunch of like 90s and current indie bands are gonna okay. be there. okay this one was so more um spent- like alternative pop punk would be the the mm. vibe yeah, a little bit, some some a little hardcore because there was a lot. New Jersey has kind of got a big hardcore scene and has for a long time. Yeah. So um, so there was a lot of local New Jersey, New York bands that kind of, it was pretty cool, actually. That is cool. I was just wondering because I knew Boston Calling was over the weekend and I was like, who's not at Boston Calling? Because that's a huge festival. So yeah. Blink-182. Not yeah, well, that, I, to be fair, I was there for... Paramore, Hot Milk, Royal and the Serpent, and like uh, Coheed and Cambria. Those were the five I really wanted to see. So I was there for I, alternate bands. <laughs> I think Paramore played a Magic Kingdom grad night when I worked in Magic Kingdom like 100 years ago. But I think they went on at like 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh. And my shift was over at like midnight and I was like, no, I'm not going to sneak out <laughs> at 2 a.m. for this band that just went home and went to bed. <laughs> well, that's what I did after Paramore. But that's the second the... Paramore ended, I was like, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't have did you... the tolerance for night night time visits anymore. 
<laughs> I don't have much music or um yeah much music festival tolerance anymore, which is a shame because I used to really like going to them, but now we're like VIP only people. That's because everybody's I am. just so young. <laughs> Well, I like, you know, I got my ass kicked in VIP last summer. Um, and so when yes. this is, yeah, this was the first concert I've been to since, like first festival. And I told my husband, I said, can we do VIP? And my, my husband's a very much in the pit kind of guy. Like he was a drummer. Yeah. He's very much, he wants to get as close to the stage as possible. So there were a lot of times that I was, like, I'll see you later. I'm going to be sitting here on the beach near the waves and I'll listen from afar because I'm short and I can't see shit anyway, <laughs> you know? Um, so there was some of yeah. that, but I think next time I would want to do VIP, like in general. Yeah, I did. I'm a, I'm definitely a stage, like on the rail kind of person, but my husband's not. So that's funny. <laughs> Maybe Corey and I can hang out so, together, keep each other company. That's what we need. We need to double date this. Yeah. Cause, um, <laughs> I don't mind getting in there by myself, but, uh, I do feel bad like leaving Corey behind. So <laughs> he needs a friend. <laughs> Yeah, he says he doesn't, but he does. I like I said a stage. (laughs) They had two stages next to each other, and they were alternating one stage versus the other. And then there was a main stage farther away. So I kind of plopped myself down on the sand with like a lot of bubble around me. So like I had a lot of space. And uh, and then Jason was just like, "Okay, I'll meet you back here in thirty minutes when the next band's over." I'm like, "Great, hon, see ya." And he called me last night. He called me a lone wolf. And I was like, you're not wrong. I'm totally happy on my own. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty much how I feel, too. I'd go yeah. alone. I don't know why yeah. I think other people mind being alone when I don't mind being alone. But I'm like, you can't be alone. That reflects badly on me. What is that? <laughs> is that a mom thing? It's embarrassing. <laughs> I don't know. I've got one kid that can't be alone and one that's like, I'm like, come hang out with us. And she's like, ew, no, you're embarrassing. So I guess I could go either way. But I've had part, a couple days like where, yeah, I like haven't seen Calvin until dinner time. He's in my house. <laughs> I know he's here. Well, that's having a He teenager. built a computer so far. Good yeah. For him. Well, he's an adult. I know, well, I know, but yeah. I mean, that's remnants of what it was like when he was, you know, pre-college. I know. I remember I remember when he just kind of vanished for a couple of years. <laughs> I was like, oh, good thing I have a dog. So <laughs> <laughs> he was just preparing you for the empty nest syndrome. He really, yeah, he started it at like 13. He was like, all right, you're on your own, mom. Like, okay. Aww. But we were inseparable and he was little, so it was probably for the best. Kind yeah, of and that swings that back bit. around, I think. Um, like I just got home an hour ago, we overslept and I'm like, Jason, shit, it's, it's like eight forty five. <laughs> we're supposed to be home now. And he's like, oh shit. So we packed up and we like hightailed it out of the casino, uh, where we were staying <laughs> and didn't stop for breakfast, didn't have anything. And we get home and my kids are like, Hey mom, let's sleep at the weekend. And all I'm thinking is like, Ugh, like, I just want to sleep. <laughs> oh no. So are we both on like no sleep? Because I have not been sleeping again. Uh, And I got up at like seven, which is not like me at all, because our windows were open because it got cold for some reason, like Florida's broken and birds were singing. And I was like, well, shit, I can't sleep through birds. So I got up. Yeah. So I ended up riding Ben, which I never do in the morning. So that was kind of cool and uh, had a really nice ride. And then just came in to talk to you. So that's my whole day so far. <laughs> so far, so good. I plan to talk to you. So far, so good. Shower, nap, and then my brother and sister are coming over for a barbecue with their new baby at our house. But it's going to oh, be very wow. chill. It's just oh. going to be chill. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, I think there might be a nap in my future, too. <laughs> I know, right? Today's like a really yeah. good nap day. It is. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the, first, the days I take a nap. I haven't taken one in a while. I used to take one every single day, but they're more like depression naps. <laughs> oh, yeah, I get that. I get that. Well, you know. Now I'm busy, depressed. busy. Yeah, don't be depressed. I love how you're on vacation. You're like, I wrote 28,000 words for my new book. Happy vacation to me. Oh, my God, this <laughs> book. I'm so excited about this book. I wrote 5,000 words on it yesterday. Um, It's about 33,000 words long now. 
and I'm aiming for about 65,000. Okay. So I'm, I feel like I'm about halfway into it. And it's just like a super fun rock star romance, fake dating. And uh, it's set in Palm Springs. So I'm having a ton of fun, like looking up all these different places in Palm Springs. And now all my Facebook ads are like, oh, are you staying at this luxury resort in Palm Springs? Like, no, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> You're like, none in this I lifetime, wish. friend. <laughs> <laughs> it just felt books, like it wanted to be set there i have a really good feeling about it i really do i bought a cover for it from this designer that i really like i've never bought any of his stuff before and i was looking at it I'm like this is the perfect cover that never happened so i bought the cover and had him adjust it to my branding and uh yeah i'm pretty psyched about it it's kind of sexy Ooh. um which i haven't written before uh, so it just decided it wanted to be a little, a little sexy. So we're, we're going with that. So you. We'll see how, fun. see how far it goes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've it's, already it's, told there's you a lot of quivering. That, Ooh, a lot of quivering, quivering members. <laughs> <laughs> I always think about the 10 things I hate about you when she's helping with like my two messant member and she's giving her all the adjectives for swollen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wish that. they used more adjectives now. Like Regency romances, you know, for the years they just used like they would say things like her her Venus mound and things like that. <laughs> and I kind of wish they'd go back to that because some of the <laughs> stuff I've read lately, I'm like, this is disgusting. <laughs> like I don't <laughs> don't if a man said like if a man said some of the things some of these men say to their girlfriends in these romances, I'd be like, ew, get out, ew, no, we're not. <laughs> no. We're not using la- clinical or, terminology. Or you'd laugh in their face and you're what? like, uh, or you'd laugh in their face and be like, mm, we're done. No, I can't take you seriously. Oh, completely. Anyway. Oh, oh my it's God. so nasty. If somebody pointed out, it's like an anatomy lesson every time. Like, yeah, what happened to like euphemisms? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> my whole life is. I don't euphemism. need you to spell it out for me. <laughs> oh, my God. That's too funny. I am. Um, I'm actually reading a very fun book I've never read before, and it's kind of a cross between a like Celtic quest versus a romance in the Scottish Highlands. And did not mm. think. I mean, both of those things are up my alley. But as I'm reading it, they actually do it pretty well. It's not like a quest book. It's not like super high fantasy. So it's like a nice marriage yeah. between kind of a. You know, a Highland romance, modern romance, and then like this, you know, the the quest that I, I like those stories myself. So it's kind of interesting, but uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to put down. And like, I look at my husband, I'm like, you're not a Highlander and I kill. Like, what the fuck is <laughs> like, your name's Wallace. <laughs> Come on, man. Like, step up. Oh, can you get him a kill? I could. Maybe this I mean, is worth the- pursuing. The Wallace clan has still got, you know, their colors. I could probably do some research and I just, uh, he's got good legs. I think he could pull it off. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, he's got a craggy enough face. He like, does. He's a fine looking man. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's got a mask. Yeah, put him in a kill. It's probably one of the most accessible um plaids to find really like wallace probably well and here's here's, of all the scottish diaspora (laughs) here's a a fun fact um so in two weeks they're having a renaissance fair in new jersey that i'm taking my girls to and the theme is the highland games yay caper tossing i know i i highly doubt that they will be doing that but it would be cool to see if they did what Oh, we'll see. I mean, it's New Jersey. You'd think they could attract some talent. It's a large metropolitan area. Let's get some caber tossing. They I do know. it in Florida. Do they? There's a huge Highland Games down here. Yeah, I don't remember where it is, but th- I know there's a really big... I used to teach this kid uh, riding lessons, and her parents were super into being Scottish. That was like their identity was being Scottish-American. And like they would always go, they're like, the Highland Games are coming. <gasps> like, oh, okay. <laughs> they get camp at it and wear all their plaids and stuff like that i knew some people in maryland like that too they were hyper scottish american i guess we'll know i'll have to take some pictures and video and we'll have to share it because this will be my first time ever at a renaissance fair first time at a highland Games. so i just hope they don't cheese out you know i hope it's pretty cool it's the one i went to was more like 
a flea market than anything, but it was still fun. Yeah. But it was very much like here we're selling a lot of trinkets. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. There was uh, the only thing was I had uh, some friends invited me to Belmont. and I've never been to Belmont for the stakes, you know? And oh. then I was like, oh, shit. But I already told my daughters I'd take them to this Renaissance Fair. And it was like the same day. And I was like, shit. Once again, cannot go to one of the Triple Crown because, you know, I don't want to disappoint my kids. And the Renaissance Fair is only a certain time of year. And they won't go to Belmont with me. So parenting has to. There's actually a better racing day in like july usually if you want to go for a stakes like Which right around i think right around the fourth of july like for a stakes race weekend yeah. the um we used to really like going it's when like the jockey club gold cup and everything is okay and it's usually a really good stakes day i'll look it up and, t- and tell you when it is and if you wanted to go to belmont this summer that would be the time to go that would be fun if, I, you're, um... if you're in town I usually go to the Haskell Invitational at Monmouth Park because that's like our backyard. And uh, right. I used to ride on Amori Haskell's estate. So that's so – I, I feel like <laughs> I know estate. him. I used to ride on his estate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a long history about the estate. It's pretty cool. But either way, I mean, I also need to kind of backpedal and slow down a little because May was just too much stuff. Mm-hmm. It's going to feel so good when you take a break because my break this month has been so good. And like, I'm tired physically from doing stuff, but it all needed doing. Like, I'm almost done raking and seeding one paddock. <laughs> and uh, and I have grass seedlings coming up, so it's already feeling really worth it. Um, and I've, you know, I've been riding a ton and it's just been a really good break and I've written so much. It's insane. So like, who knows when you don't have to go anywhere, life is good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Usually I try to cut my hours in summer for clients because the, I have the kids and so I have to worry about the kids. Right. And um, so that usually means more time at the barn and more time writing, which I'm pretty excited about. Plus I have a deadline in July. So I've already planned a week mm-hmm. in Vermont to finish the book. Um, like it's already almost there. I just need to put the finishing touches on it before sending it to my editor. So pretty excited. Excellent. Yeah. That'll be a relief. Book for hire. Yeah. 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 I don't know how yeah, I like it. on that a long time. Well, yeah, they had a, a, they gave us a year and a half, so I haven't been rushing for it. But at the same time, it's like having a deadline kind of stinks in some ways. It's a motivating in one way, but it stinks in another because I don't want to mm-hmm. not mi- hit the deadline, but it keeps me going. So yeah, it's kind of been this long project that I'm really excited to see done and complete and, and on the shelves. Yeah. I feel like it probably would have been easier if they'd given you like four months. Yeah. And you agreed. just had to do it. You just had to drop everything and do it. <laughs> yeah. And then that's your focus. But it's cool because my co-author, you mm-hmm. know, the girl, Sid Collier, who is the 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 memoir, it's her memoir. She's got an, like a, um, a movie, a documentary coming out about her in June. I saw that. I got the email. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's the person. Yeah. <laughs> Tether's person. She had mentioned it. And I was like, that sounds really cool. But now I'm like, oh, my God, I got to have to watch this. This is awesome. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. That's so, awesome. Yeah, cool things. Wendy Murdoch has been helping writers overcome fear for over 30 years, drawing on her personal experience As an equestrian from traumatic injury to recovery, Wendy provides riders with a roadmap to finding joy in the saddle by understanding our alarm bells, fear and pain, so that we can enjoy the ride. Make sure to visit thewholerider.com to sign up. Um, I was thinking for today, we had some people in the clubhouse mention that they really liked the boarding barn episode and what to look for and the red flags yeah. and that they thought it would be good to do one about trainers. And I thought, hot damn, that sounds like a great idea. I'm sure we both have a lot of weird trainer experiences. <laughs> yes. And there's such a personal thing. Like a, your trainer can be your best friend. Your trainer can be like your mom. 
Your trainer can be super terrifying dictator in your life. And sh- and your trainer can be all three of those things. Yeah. And, and I it think it's some people learn works. different ways. Some people want the warm and fluffy. Some people want a Hitler type trainer who criticizes everything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've had them both. I I had this one person who was not technically my trainer, but she was like the top trainer at the barn I was riding in. And sometimes she would watch the lessons. And I always said, without a doubt, she was my kryptonite. Every time I got so tense and so hyper aware of what I was doing because I was so felt so under her her like eye that I would inevitably make a mistake and fall and do something stupid. And that the day I didn't do that and I decided I'm just going to ride was the day I graduated and was like, okay, she doesn't scare me anymore. But it took a long time. Yeah. I think my natural arrogance has always sort of seen me through those kind of situations where if somebody shows up that I want to, somebody shows up that maybe I'm kind of afraid of, I will be like I'm going to impress this person and uh try to ride my absolute best and um so I usually end up I'm, I'm speaking very much in the past tense when I say this because I haven't <laughs> been anywhere near a riding instructor in 25 years um <laughs> that I would like really show up whenever a big trainer you know was in the ring but that didn't necessarily mean I was doing a great job but I was showing up for myself anyway (laughs) yeah what they had to say about me might be a different story i think that the interpersonal relationships are what is most interesting to me because i have had trainers in the past whom maybe i learned a lot from them but maybe ethically they were on shaky ground and like from a horsemanship perspective i had to forget a lot of what they taught me but from a riding perspective um, they were incredibly valuable to me. And I don't know how I would approach that. That's not true. I know how I would approach that now. If I didn't enjoy their horsemanship, I wouldn't work with them. But when I was a you know a hungry teenager, what was most important was getting my riding sharpened up to the point where I could bring home ribbons. And so I worked with people that now I would consider, no, I won't work with you. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I was learning. I didn't necessarily know. But I think that's like a huge thing people need to consider if if their horsemanship ethics are on track. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think your priorities change. I mean, I look back Mm -hmm. at all of the places I've ridden over the years. And now my trainer that is at my barn, she has become one of my best friends. I've known her for almost 12 years now. Um, she started out solely as my trainer. And uh, I don't think anybody knows me better when it comes to horses. But I look back at some of those other trainers. And there's some that I really liked some of the things they did and taught me and others that I'm like kind of ashamed to have ridden with, but I didn't know better at the time. Right? Yeah. Uh, and I see it all the time, too, when I go to clients. You know, I work at a lot of different barns of a lot of different sizes. And sometimes I look at how they treat their horses just because they're taught that way or how, you know, how they tack up or how they ride. And I, I kind of cringe. But at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm not a trainer. Who am I to judge how they're teaching someone else? I can only say what speaks to me. You know, I can judge them. I just, I can't hold it against them necessarily. <laughs> yeah, well, I so maybe the number one test, I think, of your trainers, uh, like your choice in trainers should be like, would you let anybody come to the barn and see your trainer in action? Mm. And if, you know, if the answer is maybe not, maybe I'm kind of embarrassed about some of the things that go on in my barn, then I think that has to take priority over your riding, over your skills. Um, I just think we're kind of advanced as horse people past where we were 10 or 20 years ago, where we know so much more about how horses learn and how horses react, um, you know, and physical reactions to mental stress and things like that. I think we know better and we have to treat our horses better. 
Yeah. And some of the things that I see, especially that are red flags, you know, there's in the United States, we don't have the training and education that they do in literally, you know, Canada, Europe. So anyone can say, like, I could call myself a trainer and go start teaching right away based on the experience that I have, Right. right? But does that make me a qualified trainer? No. So, you know, I, my biggest question is, would I let this person ride my horse? Based on what I see them do with other horses, would I let them ride my horse? And that for me is like the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, it's so funny. It's a funny thing to talk about for me because like, I haven't trusted anybody to be my trainer in a really long time. Because uh, I can't afford the people that I feel like I want to ride with. <laughs> <laughs> and and when you say like, oh, you know, there's no educational requirements, I think that's a really important and unfortunate um, thing to to have going on in the United States. It's really sad that we don't have a regulation on on horse training because you really you can just show up at somebody's barn and and they can tell you a whole lot of stuff about their qualifications but riding is not teaching number one and uh and people make shit up all the time number two <laughs> my my favorite so Natalie. you don't really know <laughs> i'm sorry i don't but my favorite is there's like three trainers in my area that don't ride they don't actually ride they just train others to do yeah. it yeah that is crazy to me. It 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 is. I agree. There was I I took a a lesson, which is in air quotes, from a woman a few years ago when I was looking to start riding again, and it, it was very clear that she had nothing to do with her horses. She had kids running her barn, and her riding lesson consisted of sitting next to an arena on a raised platform with some other people and chatting while people rode around the arena. That was her lesson. And she would shout out, maybe trot now. And that was like... Super helpful. Take I don't even you. know if she'd ever been on a horse, let alone teach a lesson. <laughs> no, it's so It true. was insanity. So and there were like six horses in the ring. <laughs> oh, my God. So she was making money. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, she was making money know. at it. I find that... I just... Listen... I, I'll let you in on a little secret here. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but um, when my kids started riding, um, the barn owner was like, you know, you can go ahead and teach your kids, right? So I taught my three children how to ride at the beginning level, mm-hmm. right? So technically, have I trained? Yes. Am I a riding instructor? Have been. But once they got to a certain point, I said, you know, Jesus, take the wheel. Here you go. And I handed them off to a trainer who was going to push them harder and be able to like, you know, because like all their ponies I'd get on in school and no problem. But once they got to a certain level, you know, I was like, okay, now a professional needs to take over for this. Right. So. Right. Well, there is that point. And I think you can, I can start out a kid and I can give help to, you know, my peers, but I wouldn't presume to say I'm going to train you and your horse through, you know, first level dressage or, or a prelim eventane or something. Because um, I don't have any, I can do those things. It doesn't mean I have any training in the methodology of teaching someone else. And I wish there was more, um, I wish there was more methodology behind like um, how to teach, how people learn, like you were saying. I've been introduced to a trainer here in the Ocala area who uses Enneagrams to um, sort of figure out exactly how her individual students like to learn and then tailoring her lesson program to them. That's so intense and interesting to me. That's a person who said, I'm going to be a riding coach first and foremost, not I'm going to train horses and teach riding lessons to make money on the side. You know, that's a person who if she tailors every training program to her students and they're very successful and very good riders and devoted to her. And I'm like, more of that, please. <laughs> you know, that actually reminds me of our sponsor, like Wendy Murdoch, because she just released that whole rider mm-hmm. uh, video series. And I think that's what she does. She focuses on the rider and their biomechanics and where their body is in space and then how it affects their riding. And she's got such a loyal following. Yeah. 
Yeah. Pe- you know, people like that who, if they, if you focus, right? Like you say, I want to be a coach. I'm going to be an amazing coach. Then you do develop that kind of following, like those people that are going to be by your side and they're going to evangelize for you and you're never going to lose them. And that might be the most important thing to look for when you're looking for a trainer. You're not looking for a great rider. You're looking for a great riding instructor. And those aren't the same thing. Right. Because that just because they can ride well doesn't mean they can teach you to do the same. Mm hmm. Well, mm-hmm. and I have, or, I will say, in the, on the it opposite. It doesn't always mean they have the, well, I was going to say they don't necessarily have the overriding interest in making you a great rider. Sure. They might just want to make money on the side. You know yeah. what I mean? Well, I have And they're somebody... not focusing on you. Like, are they developing a lesson plan for you beforehand? Or are you showing up, mounting up, and they're like, oh, okay, what are we going to do today? You know? Right. Let's walk to our canter. Let's do that. You know, I, I have... I have this trainer who I've worked with who I'd come in and I'd say like, you know, I'm feeling really kind of lazy today, right? And she's like, okay. So she mm-hmm. tailor her lesson to in a way to get me excited, to get me thinking, to get me doing things where like on another day she's like, okay, let's work on this. Or if I'm saying I'm feeling a little nervous, she's like, okay, let's work on our walk, trot and how we bend and supple rather than pushing – you know, and doing these things like or jumping cross rails, like let's so she would tailor that to me. And I find like, that's like a unicorn in the trailer in like the writing instructor world. That is something that I like that flexibility. Yeah. And that's something that, again, you um, when somebody specializes in training horses, that's something that a good trainer would do with their horse, right? You ride the horse that, that showed up that day, not the horse that you planned to ride, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. And it's going to be exactly the same with students. You know, they're going to show up in all kinds of moods, especially oh, if you teach kids, teenagers, <laughs> oh, you never know what you're going to get. Never, never um, know. And knowing when to push like, and these things like it's. Yeah. How many, mm-hmm. how many lessons a day are they going to teach too? Like, are they burnout out the end of the day? Or are they just phoning it in? Right. Man. If you had to. If somebody came to you right now and said, I would like to take riding lessons, I'm a beginner, where should I go? Would you have an answer for them or would you have to like think? No, I have an answer. Um, that's and cool. that's because I would recommend my trainer. And it's a small facility, mm-hmm. but like I like that about it. She's the only one training. She and her daughter are the only ones training. And for them, the horsemanship and the riding is better than winning shows or doing all those things like they have Mm -hmm. plenty of people who show and it's lovely but like case in point my trainer is one that if i say you know i'm really struggling right now i don't want to push my horse can you get on him and show me how to do this and that it's going to be okay she'll get on she'll just like let me show you and then she's like okay he's ready for you go ahead and try that you know i love that about her she's so flexible and she's so like she honors people in their fears. She doesn't brush them off. Like I've had other trainers that are like, get over it. Just keep going. Right. I'm, I'm probably have ridden more with the, you got to push through it kind of trainers. Um, because that's, you know, my personality is like, I'm, I'm a go suck on a rock kind of person. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just how I was raised. It was like, you got a problem? Welp. <laughs> we all got problems, kid. You know, so <laughs> I'm, I definitely, I could handle the tear jerkers and uh, the shouters and the, <laughs> the please, please stop chasing me with a ledge whip trainers. Like <laughs> I've had them all and thrived. <laughs> the tough love ones, right? Yeah. Yeah, I really have. And and I would like, especially when I was a teenager, like I would devote myself to these people, like <laughs> just do anything for them. I used to, I had a trainer when I was a teenager here in Florida. We did everything together. We went to concerts. We drove up and down riding horses all over the county. Like if I drive in the county where I grew up over on the Space Coast, I'll be like, I rode a horse there. I've been down that road. I rode a horse on that farm. Hey, you see that exit? I've been down there and rode a horse. Like she took me all over the place <laughs> and just put me on random horses. And it was a really good relationship. Um, it was weird, but it was good. 
And, uh, and I learned a ton from her about how to be a horsewoman and how like not to be a regular just person because her life was a disaster otherwise. <laughs> she was hanging out with me. I was 17. <laughs> Hey, but barn rules apply. Um, Age ain't nothing but a number, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was something else. We had a good time. I have no idea what happened to her. (laughs) Well, I tell you, I mean, I've ridden with those nonsense trainers and and enjoyed it for what it was worth. But I think Mm -hmm. as I got to be older and I started to have my own opinions of how I should do things... Um, I like someone who's willing to look at my point of view and say, you know what, let's try it, see if it works. And like, let me make the mistakes sometimes. Mm-hmm. And uh, I yeah, think because you're the one. Yeah, I mean, you have to be respected for I ride this horse five days a week and you see him on the sixth day. So when you, you know, if the trainer says, you know, you're ready to go ahead and pick up this collection and you say, well, I need to work. I would need to work him in more in in these different ways. The trainer might not see it, but you can feel it because that's your horse. That's what you do. You know, it's like, I guess there, there needs to be a lot of respect for a variety of horse as well for a trainer. Like they need to understand they're seeing lots of different horses. Like if I go and train with somebody who mostly trains thoroughbreds, I have a completely different warm up with Ben than I would have with a thoroughbred to the tune of like, 10 minutes versus 30 minutes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I have to give Ben a, war- a-, a warm up that would send a thoroughbred like into the sky. They wouldn't be able to handle it. That's, you know, he's a different, different kind of horse. <laughs> he's mentally and physically not like a thoroughbred. I think and that he so brings up an amazing point. Like, I think that's Ooh, an amazing point. I love point. bringing up amazing points. Yeah. And, and the reason mm. is, is because. I think, and this is why I think it's important for a riding instructor to also be a rider, because how can they teach you to ride if they've never ridden the horse and they don't know their buttons or what makes them tick or what helps them go? Um, I had a a trainer that I had hired to ride my pony who is very technical and he's very pokey and he's very hard to, to get moving beautifully. And she would tell me she would ride him but wouldn't and then she'd complain to the others that she hated my pony but then she'd try to train me on him and i'm like no 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 like <sighs> this is not how he works like he needs like you know you're telling me to open up my rein but this way he needs me to hold him with the rein here and open the other side like you know mm-hmm. and i'm like you're fired like i can't have you if you don't know what horse you're working with you know i i found that very frustrating yeah no, that that is huge, and every horse has a different background, um, so they're all you know they're all gonna have different expectations of you as a rider, and so yeah, you're learning all their buttons every single day, and somebody tells you, well, those those are the wrong buttons, I'm like, well, you're gonna have to adapt because this is the horse that I have. I can't make him into the horse that you wish you had or the horse that you're used to having. So that breadth of experience. That really comes into play. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I know there are a lot of really <laughs> awesome, aggressive, you know, 20 something girls out there who have ridden, you know, 50 off track thoroughbreds and they know how to train those horses and that's super, but they, they're not going to have a good relationship with my horse. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I exactly. didn't have a good relationship. Yeah. It took a really long time for me to learn how to ride them. So I know the difference. Yeah. I think it's important to have like, you know, someone that you're working with that knows different types of horses and uh, and can then say like, oh, this is what really worked for me. Have you tried this? Or here's some homework for you to mm-hmm. do. Um, when you ride him, if you focus on these things, let's try that again next week and see how we've improved, right? Like, I love that. That's give me that every day yeah. of the week. You absolutely, you you should absolutely be assigned homework. Absolutely. Um. And and there should be a constant call to action, like feel that that's what you want to feel at this point in your ride every day. If you don't feel this, you don't move on, you know, like micromanage me a little bit so that I don't screw up during the week when I'm being <laughs> hounded by a million different, you know, things 
in my life and I get on my horse and I go, what the hell am I doing? Well, if you can, as a trainer, give me those tips to get me through the week, then I'm not going to waste time and I'm not going to waste my money not progressing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I I really, I struggle a lot with direction. So that would be huge for me. Yeah. Which is why, I mean, you don't have access to a trainer near you. So you've been using the writing app. I have a trainer, Mm -hmm. but unfortunately I've only been able to take like one lesson a month based on my current schedule right now. Still more than I've done in the last, you know, four years. But uh, because we took a hiatus, she was at a different barn and I ended up leaving that barn and you know, I cried because I didn't want to leave my trainer. But at the end of the day, like, you know, you got to do what's important for you. So I am kind of coming back to it now. And now I'm finding that when I'm writing, by the end of the lesson, I'm so proud of us that we had talked to the other day about like, she she laughed at me. She goes, Heather, now go go jump that cross rail line. And I, I looked at her and like, really? Because I, I didn't think we were legged up and ready for that. But I was willing to try if she thought I was right. And everyone's like, yeah, <laughs> Heather's going to jump. Heather's going to jump. And I haven't jumped in probably a year and a half, right? And my pony loves to jump. So he used to be a hunter. Now he's like, you know, races to the to the bottom of the fence because um, he gets so excited. So I'm working on – that's my goal is – you know what? Let's get back to that. Let's get back to where we could jump a little course or a little line and just have fun. Um, we both love it, but I didn't feel confident when I wasn't under the supervision of a trainer because that's how I got tossed last time. <laughs> we came into a crowd right. at a gallop. <laughs> yeah. I've really been holding off on, on jumping schools because, yeah, I, I just want to have all my foundation in place because I just and Ben's you know Ben has actually ribboned quite a lot in the hunter ring without me uh like while I was doing dressage with him and then a student would take him on the weekend and 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 take him in all these um hunter classes and he'd bring home lots of ribbons so he knows how to jump a course it's not a problem for him I just really just I just I'm at a point where like I want everything to be perfect. I don't want to screw this up. <laughs> and, and I don't have anyone to say, all right, I'm going to set the fence here and you're going to come to come into it. And, you know, and sort of um, eyeball me all the way through. I, 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 I miss that. I wish I had that. But my app will have to do as I yeah. continue. Um, well, when I come getting visit him you, on the leg and getting that. him supple. I can do that for you. When That's I come what visit. I need. Yeah. You yeah. can come here and be my jumping instructor. Yeah. I mean, again, (laughs) I have trained people before, not just my kids, but like I have been offered jobs to be Mm -hmm. a trainer and I've turned them down because I need another job, like a hole in my head. But I have a good eye eye, and I know what needs to be done. I just don't always have the guts to like make it happen for myself, but I know how to do it. Um, And so, yeah, it's fun when you help. Well, it's also more fun sometimes when you have someone to ride with. Like I crave the days by myself, but it's fun to have my trainer Mm -hmm. there get, you know, pointing like out the good things or even, and this is crazy. She took a video of me the other day. She was so happy with our trot. She was like, she took a video without me knowing because she knows I'm really shy with the camera when I, you know, I'm riding. <laughs> not any other time. I'm not shy. Okay. I was uh, going to say. Uh. <laughs> I just, I'm shy about riding because I'm so like, I'm, I critique myself so much. Right. Um, so yeah. she took it the other day. And that was really cool to be like, oh, my God, I have this person who's in my corner who is cheering me on and is so proud of me that she wants to, you know, show other people that that like we can do it. That's great. I That's got to be the ideal situation <laughs> right there. Like, what are you what are you looking for in a trainer? Look for that. Look for somebody yeah. who's cool and in your corner and, you know, checks in with you to make sure that you are, you know ready for what she's got on her plans and can get on your horse and show you how to do things. Like your trainer sounds awesome. She is like, awesome. You, she is. that's it. That's the show. I have Heather's trainer. Yeah. Thanks for tuning and, in. And she actually um, did, did go to school for this too. So like she's one of the few. Oh that my actually, God. I was like, I found a unicorn that's and her perfection. name is Robin. <laughs> But <laughs> no, it's true. And like I've seen her daughter grow up. She's trained her daughter herself and her daughter will go and, and she thinks it's important for her daughter to ride with other instructors just to push her a little bit and do all that, which like, isn't that 
the best thing when you have someone in your corner saying like, you need to do what's best for you. And that's not always going to be me. Mm hmm. That's, that's so important. I, I, you know, I was at, at one point, I was a manager at a, at a large lesson facility. And a lot of our kids didn't progress. They just didn't progress. And it was because the trainers, for the most part, were not, they weren't committed to the kid's success. They were committed to getting the kid back out every week and on the horse. And for them, that meant keeping the kid happy. And a lot of these kids were like super upper middle class, coddled, you know, did riding in addition to tennis and this, that, and the other thing. Like riding was just one more thing on their resume. And uh, and it was disheartening to see them come every week and really not get better and really not go to shows and things like that to just be at the status quo. And it was because the, their instructors just weren't um, they, it wasn't that the instructors didn't know what to do because they were actually all BHS certified in instruction. But the attitude at the barn was just keep them coming. It wasn't like, let's push. And I think a good trainer does need to know if somebody has goals, then they need to talk that out and be like, look, sometimes I'm going to push you. And that's how we're going to reach our goals. Especially with kids, mm-hmm. you know, who sometimes we'll resist for no good reason. An adult might have a reason for resisting and then you have to talk through that. Your trainer has to turn into a therapist and talk you through that resistance. But yeah. uh, there will be moments where you have to push through, you know? Yeah. I mean, I see this because, you know, my own kids ride. Um, I see kids at what we call the like cookie cutter burns that are literally just factories. They're like, let's get you walk trot cantering mm-hmm. as fast as possible. And then the quality isn't really quite what it should be. And then I look at, you know, how my daughters learned to ride, which was let's focus on the basics, the foundation. My one daughter was terrified to canter. The other one was pushing for it way before she was ready. And now it's funny. They both came to it on their own time. Uh, and they both now it's their favorite thing to do, but the one grew in confidence because she had that ability. Now she knows how to steer. She knows how to control the horse. She knows how to control the extension of the canter before she even learned to canter, right? Like she, she had yeah. those things. Um, and then her friends are like coming to visit us and they're like, we know how to walk track canter and we put them on my pony and my pony is like, peace out bitches like they don't know anything (laughs) and i'm like this is bad like this is bad and my pony is so quiet like he's so sweet but um they can't even get him to walk forward and and go into a trot without him tossing his head because they're pulling on his mouth you know right i wish that i had a i had a the riding instructor that i had as a like as a 10 year old who for the record is now like a high school dressage rider on the West Coast. It's astonishing what this man can do with a horse. But he was my first riding instructor when I was 10 at a hunter barn. And he taught me the way I wanted to be taught, which was I wanted to um, I wanted to go as quickly as possible. I wanted to jump as many things as possible. <laughs> like that was my whole interest from day one. He let me canter in my first lesson. Oh my uh, God. And I got... I got all the way up on the pony sack. I was like a 13 hand pony. And um, just just all the way up there, I was like, I'm a jockey now. This is the greatest. <laughs> Foreshadowing. And he said, okay, well, you're a little far forward on the horse sack. And I'm just like going around. I'm bouncing uh, <laughs> with my hands way up in his mane. I was like, yes, this is my life now. Uh and I remember reading, I was reading the Saddle Club at the time, and like everybody had to ride for six months before they were allowed to jump. And I remember thinking that was the most horrifying rule I had ever heard of, because if I had to wait six months to jump, I was going to die. I think I was jumping on like the fourth lesson. <laughs> oh, wow. It was within two months of starting for sure. But then I would get mad later when it would come back to some foundation piece that I didn't have yet. And I would be like, well, why didn't we do that in the first place? Like when diagonals came up, <laughs> What's I, was a furious. Diagonal? <laughs> I was furious. I was like, I had to learn how to post. I did all of that work learning how to post. And now you're telling me 
oh, you have to post this way instead. I'm like, why didn't we cover that when I started posting? I was so mad. I was like, you wanted to canter. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm over here like, you could just layer in all the info. You could have said, oh, and by the way, you have to stand. And by the way, when you stand, it has to match the horse's outside foreleg. I could have learned all that immediately without any trouble. <laughs> leads oh everything i was like why didn't i know this before i literally oh reacted that way <laughs> that's so funny that's so i wanted funny. to yeah. come out of the womb knowing this stuff and i had read so many books by the time i was 10 i had read so many writing manuals cover to cover that somehow i don't know how i missed diagonals like, I should have already known it and said, what about my diagonal when he started teaching me to post? <laughs> you you I sound called him like out on it then. he was probably just like, I'm just going to let Natalie do what she wants so I don't have to hear her yell at me <laughs> anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think there may have been an element of that. I don't know that I necessarily yelled, but I confronted. I was like, where is this co- this coming from? <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. I mean, I remember when I grew up riding at my original barn, it like I was in my first show. I'm like, I don't know what to expect at a show. They never told me. They didn't they didn't even tell me what time mm-hmm. to be there. They didn't you know, I was unprepared. Um and then the first time I ever cantered, I got bucked off. That was super fun. But I was like, Well, first canter, first buck, that's how we go. Uh, so I learned how to get right back on at that. And then I think the first time we ever did, we had like one of those games days in the big arena. So we had to like, um, jump across rail. We had to come around a barrel and then race back and hand off like our baton to someone else. I had never jumped or done barrels (laughs) until that point. (laughs) So (laughs) what? (laughs) That was the first. And then, and then of course I took the barrel real close and my horse balked because it didn't have any balance. And I was like, "We, my God, we why did go your horse like... buck so much?" Oh, that was a different horse. There's I'm a concerned. lot of buckers. Well, do that's you see so why I became a timid rider. I, I, I always had the. I the, do. The, yeah, I always had the trouble making horses. I can't tell you how many horses I had that would rear when um, standing next <gasps> to another horse waiting to go into the arena. Like, oh my God, they didn't want to wait. <laughs> yeah, I they guess, always give me the problem, uh, children. No, I didn't. No, I learned to ride on really solid citizens. I'll say that much. <laughs> I switched, you know, to racehorses because I'm insane. But the the ones that I started with were all just like punch and go, you know, like there's the course and they go, okay, jump, jump. Like there was no, if I got dumped learning flying lead changes, I got absolutely hurled into a fence just Did you really i had a velvet helmet huh i didn't hear that i got sorry. hurled i just go, huh? oh. like i got hurled <laughs> oh. it was insane yeah i was learning flying lead changes and it was you know one of those like cut across the arena and you're going to do a lead change at you know at the at the change of direction by the fence mm-hmm. And I don't know, I just went zing across the arena that I just thought, I was like, okay, this is like a motorcycle, right? Like you just turn real hard and and the whole horse will turn. And he went the other way. And I'm not even sure how. Uh, yeah, I ended up with this gash in my in the velvet of my helmet from uh, like sliding along the arena fence with it, with my head, just like. Zoom. It was probably I probably should have replaced that helmet. Uh, oh God! <laughs> now that I think about it, I had that yeah. helmet for several years. Uh, yeah, it was expensive. So that happened, and then I had my first horse was a quarter horse that I had like right after that horse that threw me into the fence, and he would just occasionally throw on the brakes in front of a fence. I don't know why. No one ever told me if I wasn't setting him up or if he just was like, eh, maybe not. <laughs> and I slay. I went head first into a roll top, like Ooh. bang, <laughs> to a roll top. So anytime you, there's like a weird silence where I should have said something and you're waiting for me to say something, it's probably from like hitting that roll Brain. top. <laughs> Contusion. <laughs> Yeah, some, some there's just a little, a little arrest moment every now and then. 
Well, yeah, 11 years old. There. Hit a roll top. I think mm-hmm. I remember one of my favorite memories. And I guess my trainers back then, because the horses were a little wild, I guess they trusted me because I don't remember learning a lot from them. They were like big classes, too. And so you'd like get to do one canter because there were like seven children all learning to canter and come uh, around at the same time. Oh, right? yeah. It was like factory. Mm-hmm. And so we'd go out on these trail rides every once in a while when it was perfect. And we'd be galloping through the woods. And I'm talking narrow ass paths where you'd be dodging tree branches and things like that. And then like coming up the road with cars passing you. Like the amount of stuff I did successfully as a child <laughs> – was but it's like it's like oh that's why I'm like this now because I know what could go wrong. <laughs> but you know I do I was think a that ju- yeah yeah like I was a junior trainer by the time I left there. But I I yeah no I would think I'm good and I kind of learned over the years what I I liked and didn't like about trainers and for the time that I left my current trainer and and we'd gone on to different I didn't really ride with anybody else I took a couple lessons here or there but. I just was like, no, she's the one for me. She's my she's my significant other. You know, she's my trainer. And uh, I'll just wait. And so when she opened up her own barn, I was like, I will be there with two horses and you'll never let me go. Okay. Just FYI. <laughs> so when you have the right fit, you got to stick with it. I think you do. Be- it, yeah. It's, it's so hard to find that again. And like for me, I like riding with you know, I like riding with pros, but I also want to be important. You know what I mean? You are important. And so I want everyone to know how important I am. (laughs) And so if I were to uh, go ride, you know, like when I was, you know, when I was still eventing before I I quit riding and everything like that, I was riding with uh, somebody from um, like the Australian eventing team. That would not be a good fit for me now, not because I don't think I would excel with that level of instruction because I do, but I want to be really important. I want to be a like a member of that person's like barn family. You know what I mean? Not sure. show up once a week or twice a month or something like that and be one more student. I really want to be like treasured. <laughs> oh, you need and to come to my barn. I, you would be treasured. I want to be treasure you. I want to be like a f- maybe not the favorite, but one of the favorites. That would be really important to me. So would it make you I mad if be, I told I you be that when I walk into the barn, I usually have three to four teenagers running up, be like, "Heather, you're here," and like showing me that they. No, that would be really like, important to me. I've been missing that my whole life and I finally feel like I have it. Like it's it's the only way I would ever leave this situation is if I have my own place. But at the end of the day, like mm-hmm. when these kids go to college, I'm going to cry. Like I'm going to cry because yeah. it's so sweet. <laughs> I feel like everybody's barn ants. Mm-hmm. I could do that. I could do that if I had a barn. But uh, if I had a barn, I would never ride. So because I would never That's go. That's true. <laughs> No, that's highly true. Because I can't make myself leave. Yeah. Well, so let's this is talk the only way it works for me. Our adulting wins before we go because we're almost okay. to that time. You and I have have it's been three days and we have so much to catch up on. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was don't even know where to begin with wins, but since we're talking about training, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with with training. And um, so I rode this morning and. I have been riding consistently enough now for the past two months that even with, you know, taking five days off to go to Kentucky or I've been riding every other day for the past week because I've been working on the pasture and I have to prioritize that. But I am able now to feel uh, like gains where it was like a week ago we were having some issues with jigging constantly from the walk to the trot anticipation. And I can feel now today how we have worked through that and it comes up a little bit, but it's almost gone. And so I feel like every week I can, I can see progress and I can see like the way that both of us are changing and it's, quite obvious and I think that's so cool and I haven't felt like this in like a hundred years so that's, that's definitely awesome. my win is like pr- 
progress, measurable, visible progress on horseback. That's what I've got. That's huge. <laughs> That's a huge win because if you don't feel like you're progressing, it's really easy to stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. And we've talked about that before, like not having a goal and things like that was really, was really interrupting my, my whole enjoyment of having a horse around. So yeah, it's under Yay. control now. Progress. <laughs> well, so my Zilting win is, um, so we've talked a little bit, Ferris is coming back from, you know, his Cushing's and Lyme diagnoses and really just mm -hmm. struggling with his health. And I'm looking back and I'm realizing he probably had Cushing's for a lot longer than I thought. And I'm talking maybe two years mm -hmm. um, because now on his medication and with the riding we're doing, he feels like the pony I had five years ago. Like there's shades of, oh, my God, we have energy. We're balanced. We're we're not so difficult. And here is my favorite part. This is my true win. Um, the other day I got off of him after riding him for about 30 minutes. And a lot of trot work, you know, nothing super crazy, just a lot of balancing and, you know, getting him into a nice, you know, frame position. Um, not only was he a little clammy by the time I was done with him, but there were sweat marks. There were sweat marks on his kidneys. There were sweat marks around the girth and around his pole. He hasn't sweat in two years, Natalie. Wow. This is the first time I've seen sweat in two fucking years. I cried. So you might be I able cried. to ride him through the summer. That's oh. the goal. <laughs> so I, every summer I dread because I think he's going to have a heart attack and I'm really afraid to push him. Um, but now mm -hmm. with this, I'm jigging my schedule so that I can go at 730 every morning in the summer, go ride him for, you know, every other day and I'll work with Delight the other days. And like by this, I would say by the fall, we might be jumping again. We might be actually like doing really really great and i'm like it's amazing mm, that is so exciting what a good boy i know He's we get so excited so about things like sweat and good poop like oh just the greatest it's amazing. <laughs> i literally like they're like oh my god heather's crying and i'm like but they know they know how important it is to mm -hmm. me so um so, yeah, so I'm now changing my goals for the summer and thinking, like, we don't maybe have to take a step back. Maybe this is – we can – now that we know what it is, maybe we can work with it. So, yeah. Yay. That's Yay. I'm so happy for you guys. I'm happy for you, look too. I'm glad that you guys are Riding our horses. I know. Yeah. Look at us. We're amazing. We are amazing. I'm proud of us. We're I'm proud adults. of us, too. With horses. <laughs> and we're doing it. <laughs> Thank you for being a little weird with us, horse girl. If you like what you hear, make sure to subscribe to our podcast on your player of choice. Follow us on Instagram at Adulting with Horses Podcast, or even better, join our Adulting with Horses Clubhouse on Facebook, where you can become part of the show. Also, it's a great place to meet other horse crazy women.